I really love the industry, but I was kind of like, I've always had an issue with like kind of finding the right thing to do. Um, and piercing was fun. Um, and I, I enjoy it a lot, obviously. I mean, that's what my job is still based on. Like you need to have piercings to wear the stuff that I make. Hello friends, um, I'm here with piercer and creator Jagger of Red Fern Adornments. Uh, being both a jewelry creator, entrepreneur, and piercer might lend you some interesting insights to the world of body modification, and I'm excited to hear your thoughts today. Uh, so before we get to all of my questions, uh, let's start by hearing more about you. Uh, so why don't you introduce yourself? Um, yeah, my name is Jagger South, and I am the owner and founder of Red Fern Adornments and owner and founder of Secret Handshake Company, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, and I am, I guess, a retired piercer now. I pierced for okay. about two and a half years, and yeah. And I've worked in jewelry and piercing and the industry for most, I think, all of my adult life. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so, what, yeah, it's pretty cool. What got you into the industry? Um... I just really wanted it. I don't know. Like I got my ears pierced when I was like 12 years old and I'm 26 now. And it just went downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. So I've just been like modifying my body at such a young age and like pierced my septum when I was 13 and had a nose ring and all that stuff. And my ears were like two inches by the time I graduated high school. That's awesome. And yeah, just like modifying jewelry that I had at home to like better suit what I needed at the time and just spending all my like money from mowing lawns on body jewelry and stuff. It was, it was savage. <laughs> <laughs> I got to the modification game a little bit late. Like I pierced my nose, but I feel like everyone my age at like 16 pierces their nose, you know, right and my ears pierced, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, it was probably, I was probably like 20 and I actually came to Avanti and I got my septum pierced and then it was also downhill from there for me and it was like, I was busting tables and so I'd have rent money, food money, and then piercing money. <laughs> and I would come right on, right on. Every, probably, I was here like all the time, just like, okay, what's new? Let's do something else. It's just addictive. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely fun, especially when you have like a vision on... Uh, what you're trying to paint on the canvas, so to speak. It's cool to just see a little progress, like, oh, I want to do like an ear project or whatever. And you're like, oh, well, this today I'm going to do my tray, I guess. And then next month or whatever, I'll do my rook and then I'll connect them here or have a match with this or whatever. And it's like, it's, it's really fun. And that's what I liked about when I was piercing was helping people kind of paint that picture, so to speak, with their body in a sense. Yeah, yeah, it's very much a co-creative process, which is really cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely been, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then it's like the next step after you start getting holes in your body is to stretch those holes, which is a whole new uh, project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think all my piercings are, none of my piercings are like the standard size, except my nostrils, even though they're still kind of big. My nostrils are 16 gauge, but okay. every everything else is past zero. Okay, and 16 so. gauge on a nostril is not super common, but it's also not like super, you know, big. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's just, everyone's like, they're 16 gauge. I'm like, yeah, that's just what they've been. <laughs> that's yeah. what they're pierced at and that's what I wear. <laughs> and it fits. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, how yeah. was stretching your, your Libre or your uh, My Filtrum? Uh, it was definitely an interesting process. Um, it was, I definitely stretched it with some unconventional methods uh, <laughs> that I won't suggest, but um, it was definitely an interesting trip. Uh, and it's the first large oral piercing I've ever had and the only large oral piercing I've ever had. Um, and the second, third oral piercing I've ever had. So yeah, it was just like a new thing. And there was definitely ups and downs with like encapsulation problems and stuff like that, but it's all good now. And it's sitting at like 10 millimeters. So okay. it's like 
double zero, yeah. That's not bad. It's uh, yeah, it's really cool. I had mine pierced at a twelve gauge, but then I downsized it, and then I upsized it again, and that was not a fun experience for me personally. <laughs> yeah, I had mine pierced at a. 14 and then tapered to a 12 and then two days later I went to a 10 and then it was just That's I got right. it to <laughs> yeah I got it to a four gauge before it was fully healed Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah yeah <laughs> things I, I do I, it's always I was like well do as I say not necessarily as I did <laughs> Yeah, I just use the turn. I use the technique called wet stretching, and it's definitely not like for, I guess, amateurs. I don't know. I don't really suggest it to anybody, <laughs> but the theory is that the tissue, when it's like, I think the theory is obviously, don't call me on this, but when you're like stretching a piercing that's fresh, it's at its like softest state mm -hmm. because the fistula has fully formed. So it has a little bit more gif, but it hurts like all hell. So that's kind of the philosophy behind it. So there's people that have like wet stretched piercings to get like real big, real fast. And it's like kind of insane. Uh, my filtrum is not as big as like some other people have brought their other piercings. So I don't really have any like issues with it, but I've seen people like stretch their ears like super fast and you'd, you end up seeing some thinning and stuff but then there's some people that have stretched their ears super fast and there's been no issue yeah but uh when it comes down to stretching your ears you better take your time <laughs> yes i've definitely done 110 percent and it sucks to... yeah like my ears sit about three inches and i've never got my ears cut or anything oh yeah that takes yeah. some yeah because i'm only yeah. at 11 16th and i've been stretching for like three years or four years now yeah i've been i got my ears to three inches when i was 19 so i've been sitting here for about seven years okay um yeah <laughs> i don't know it's fun <laughs> uh, do your do you find that your ears keep stretching like i i guess with the bigger sizes um you don't sleep with your jewelry in or do you or yeah. No, so <laughs> I can't. It's so bad. It's like, if you want to know what it feels like, just take like go in your cupboard and go get some of those like small plates that you have and just tape them to the side of your head and try to take a nap. Yeah. I was like, I can't take a nap with mine sometimes. Like they hit my ears wrong. Um, yeah, I mine have, like yeah. press into my neck. Yeah. And like my jaw. Yeah. So, like the weird bone right here. Yeah. It's, it hurts sometimes. <laughs> So, but sometimes, like, if my ears are a little peeved, I need to sleep with, like, glass eyelets in. Mm -hmm. And it's just a nightmare waking up if I'm not, like, sleeping right. Because I have to, like, sleep like this so I can create a pocket for my ear to sit in. Then I wake yeah. up, my arm's asleep, and I'm just in a bad mood. <laughs> I've just, tried to, yeah. like, sleep like this before, even with mine yeah. being so small. Or, like, fold my earlobes up. Like, <laughs> it's a weird thing yeah. that you try to do to... Accommodate. Or you like sleep and you like wake up and you have a huge ring on your face from your eyelet and you look like a <laughs> target dog. Yeah. Now you're a raccoon. I'm a target yeah. dog. <laughs> yeah. Got a bullseye That's on my funny. face. Yeah. Um, I, so I got a little off track with your plugs, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what brought you from I guess piercing to jewelry making. So you started like modifying yourself, then you started piercing for a couple of years, and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna make jewelry now. Yeah, so I have, I think I have worked in almost every facet of this industry at one capacity or another. Um, and yeah, I just felt like that was kind of like, I don't know, I really love the industry, but I was kind of like, I've always had an issue with like kind of finding the right thing to do. Um, and piercing was fun. Um, and I I enjoy it a lot, obviously. I mean, that's what my job is still based on. Like you need to have piercings to wear the stuff that I make. It's not like a ring or a bracelet, even though I do make those as well, but it's mainly like jewelry for large stretched ears. Like. Those are cool. Yeah. Like stuff like this, like you can't, like, not just anyone can wear this. You have to be, these are specifically inch and a half. Um, anyway, 
yeah, so I don't know, uh, getting into, I was actually piercing at the time when I started making jewelry. Uh, I was living in Connecticut for a couple of years uh, and I was working for a large uh, body jewelry wholesaler doing product development and um, research and development. And that was really fun. And I was piercing, I learned how to pierce when I was in Connecticut. And then I didn't have a lot going on besides work. And I was like, oh, let me do a hobby. And previously, before moving to Connecticut, there was a gentleman uh, that I used to work with that was like doinking around making uh, like carving stone. And that was the only time I've ever seen anybody carve stone. <laughs> and it was like the most unconventional way. Like it was like a wild like tool set. Like I would never use those tools today to do what I was doing then. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I just like went to the hardware store and bought some tools and just started messing around. And then I just bought more and more machines. And now I have a 500 square foot shop with like, fuck, like a million machines in it. Oh, I'm like looking God. around my studio right now. <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I've yeah. done stone carving. It's hard. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely hard. Um, obviously, it gets a little bit easier when you have the right tools and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, yeah so I just, after with piercing, um, I just started making jewelry as like a hobby. And then I ended up moving out to Oregon. And then I couldn't get my license here. So I just kept making jewelry. And yeah. so now I make jewelry for people all over the planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, what brought you to Oregon? Um, well, Connecticut, uh, in my opinion, kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a really pretty place, but it's not somewhere that I wanted to spend my 20s. Um, I moved there when I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And I moved out of there, not, I guess out of necessity because Hurricane Sandy happened. I don't know if you remember that back in like 2012. Yeah. Um, so the tattoo shop that I was doing counter for, like I was running their jewelry counter, they closed because a hurricane blew one of their studios, well, two of their studios like away. <laughs> yeah, they're on the shore and they just like blew two of the studios away out of like the three or four they had at the time. Um, so, and I got an opportunity that I couldn't pass up in Connecticut and worked with some really great people for a few years, but Connecticut was just getting really bland yeah. um, because there's not a lot of stuff to do, uh, especially like moving there when you're 19, like you didn't go to high school there. So you didn't have like a friend rapport and I was too young to like go to bars and stuff and mingle with folks. So I was just like in a weird social stasis. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I actually, I met Tyler when I was working there. Um, and yeah, I came out to visit and then I finally met Tyler in person and he told me, he's like, cause I used to work at Avanti for a little bit. Yeah. He uh, was like, yeah, if you move out here, I'll give you a job. Like no questions asked. So I moved out and started working for him and I was making jewelry and then my jewelry grew and we parted ways. And I've been there, been there, been back there a couple of times for different occasions, but yeah. So in Oregon, I've been here for almost five years. Wow, yeah. It, it's Oregon, rad. It's a beautiful place. Yeah, I'm really happy about it. And I feel like this is kind of like where I belong. So yeah, because being from New Jersey, like I go back to visit and it's kind of like, so, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I love it there. Um, and it's like wild to say that I'm from New Jersey. Like. A, because once you're from New Jersey, like you don't usually leave New Jersey, and I, yeah. it's like a, it's like a weird thing. Like you die in New Jersey. It doesn't matter if you like move to outer space for the rest of your life. You will die in New Jersey somehow. <laughs> this is where you're like, gonna be. It's just where you're gonna be. Yeah. So it's just kind of like the whole idea, and I was able to like kind of break that mold, and it was nice. Yeah. Well, you don't sound like you're from New Jersey. Yeah. When I first moved here, I did. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, New Jersey. Uh, North Jersey has the accent that's really like hardcore, but mm -hmm. there's like different things I would say, like water, I would say warder. Warder. <laughs> yeah, I would say it like super weird. Like my old man, my dad uh, still says it like that, but um, because every time I go back, he's like, Jag, you talk different. And I'm like, what? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> 
and it's just stupid little things like that or like when i see friends and stuff that come to visit they're like yeah why do you say it like this and i'm like why do you say it like this i don't know you just like assimilate into the culture that you're in and i don't feel like people in oregon really have an accent it's just I don't think so either yeah i just had like a little one from just like the few things that i said different in new jersey that's all but like when people when people talk like this or like i don't know like from like mafia movies and, and stuff like that's just North Jersey and they basically live in New York. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, North Jersey is like Beaverton to Portland. Oh, really? It's like, there's subway lines, yeah, that go right into Manhattan and you're on the subway for like 15, 20 minutes. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, so yeah, New Jersey's super small too. It only takes th two and a half hours to get through the whole state. Oh, wow, okay. I've only, the only part of the East Coast I've been on is Florida. I've not been anywhere up past Florida. Right on. <laughs> yeah, I've been to I've been to almost every state. That's cool. I drove uh, here, so. <laughs> you drove well, yeah, that would make sense. Uh, what is the like the modification uh, modification culture between then the East Coast and the West Coast? Is it different? Um, it's not so much different now than I probably would like consider like the '90s. Um, just because we're so intertwined through social media now. Yeah. And like the develop of development of like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with BME Zine. Mm -mm. So BME Zine was like a website that you should definitely go check out after this. Uh, it was made yeah. by Shannon Lorette and it is kind of like, it's kind of like a social, well, they had like a platform called I am and that whole, um, I want to say company, but I don't know if that like organization maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, that whole organization is like the first peak at social media for the modified world. Um, That's cool. Because people were modifying their bodies, but back in the 90s when the internet was brand new, you didn't, like, if you're from New Jersey, you're not talking to someone that lives in California unless, like, your cousin lives there. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have a rapport with people. But, like, I can talk to people in India and talk to people in Brazil and I could talk to people all over this rock. And uh, it's easy and I can do it in a second. But back in the 90s, it was hard. But BME Zine kind of brought the modification culture together. So it kind of, I feel like it's smoothed out a lot, especially in 2020, because I feel like like trends and stuff, um, piercing trends, fashion trends, any kind of trend just spread so quickly because of Instagram and Facebook. So it's kind of like the same. Um, different states do have like different rule practices but i guess that's the only like difference like um for instance it's kind of funny uh because in new jersey the only kind of paper towels that you can use if you're in a tattoo or piercing studio are bounty what? that is the law well that was the law when i was there i don't know if they've changed it but yeah the legislation was written by uh modif like the people in the modified industry uh in the early 2000s oh that's funny yeah, and it's like bounty paper towels, they were the best one and they were the one that were the most absorbent and that's what they used. And that's like, that was the guideline for the Ocean County, uh, New Jersey, like <laughs> statue, yeah. You have to use it's, bounty. That's great for yeah. bounty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super great. But uh, yeah, it's just like different little quirks and stuff like that. Or just like different states, they'll be like, oh yeah, uh, the tattooing and piercing uh, regulations are brought to you by like the cosmetology department or different things like yeah it just depends on the state but stuff like that or i guess the only thing that's really different but when it comes down to like the grand scope of things not much okay i mean there, are, yeah i mean that's really it that's really cool i was like i haven't really yeah. met anyone who's been everywhere so i was like i'm curious about that <laughs> yeah there's a couple states that i haven't been to uh, some of them and like i haven't been to louisiana and like Mississippi and like those ones, but I've been to Florida all the way up uh, to Massachusetts and then almost everything across the country from like Colorado over and like Indiana, Illinois and very cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, what is your, so what's your favorite stone to work with? The age old question. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, Hey, what is um, your favorite? <laughs> yeah. So, favorite to work with as in, like, the one that gives you, like, the least amount of shit, or... <laughs> I would go... So, I'm an artist, too, and 
I yeah. definitely have a favorite color palette. So it's something that just speaks to me and I just come back to. So it's similar to that. So like, what's the favorite like stone? It doesn't necessarily have to be like the easiest to work with, but it's the one that when you're working with, you feel, I guess, the most fulfilled with. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, I mean, I haven't been doing this as long, as nearly as long as like the other folks that are in the industry that I guess are my colleagues in a sense <laughs> um, that are just, become have become like really great friends of mine um but some i don't know like when it comes down to like my favorite stone like at this moment in my life i'm bored by a lot of them except geodes right now geodes are like the one thing that i've kind of just i don't know exploited <laughs> yeah. like i have over like 300 pairs of geodes in my like inventory collection that's cool. Like, I just hoard them, yeah, and they're, like, really hard to come by. <laughs> yeah. And I search high and low, and I have contacts in Brazil, India, China, and everything to find these rocks without me physically going down there to go get it. And every year I go to the Tucson Journal Mineral Show to go pick up material. That's really cool. Um, but geodes are probably my favorite, even though they can be a pain in the butt. Like, I have, here's a pair I made the other day. We're right next to my shelf where I put all my done orders, so... <laughs> Yes. If you guys are watching, these will be shipping soon. So, oh, sweet. Yeah, they're a pair of Warring State Agate from uh, Hebu, China. Oh, cool. Yeah, they're like the cousin of Fighting Blood Agate. It's, Very uh, cool. Yeah, and then, so yeah, those are like one, some geodes, and then these are, the gray ones I showed up before are Brazilian Agate, and these are actually out of a nodule that I cut myself. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm really stoked on them. These are all for the same order. Uh, but yeah, so agate geodes are kind of my jam right now. Uh, I've been working with a lot of labradorite. I don't know. All um, stones have their own like pros and cons. Some are more fickle than others. Some are really brittle. Like labradorite is a nightmare to work with if you don't know like how to forecast about cutting it because yeah. it's not even a stone it's just layers of mica and oh, it's just like cool. yeah so like if you have a labrette like a labradorite labrette and you put it down on a counter too fast it'll like blow the wings off of it just because oh. of how fast you put it on the counter it's not yeah. even yeah really so you have to, yeah like you can throw well you can like probably like drop an agate labrette on a counter and it would be fine but if you just put a labradorite Labrette on the counter too fast, like you'll just blow the wings off of it because it's so fragile. That's really cool. But stuff like that. Um, what else has been, I've been carving? I'm trying to think. I've carved so many different things. Um, <laughs> I really like working with opalite, even though it's not a stone. It's a glass slag. Um, it's like my favorite material. I don't know why. It's it's a really it's a I like opalite too. I think it's just because it's got that like milky like, but there's different colors in there. Yeah, it's what's yeah. In yeah, it just and it goes with everything. <laughs> yeah, and they have several different colors of opalite as well. It's just oh, they're really? harder to find. Yeah, they have bubblegum opalite, mint opalite, which looks like chrysoprase. Uh, they have like a lavender opalite. It's just obviously they're all different colors, but they have that similar like base characteristic. Yeah. About them, like that milkiness and maybe they because like opalite kind of has like a blue color like it's primarily white but it has a little bit of blue and when you hold it up to the light it's a little bit of pink okay um so with the other ones they have like different color shifts in them which are pretty cool um trying to figure out what else i like to work with i just work with a lot of agate um i've been working oh oh what the i'm trying to think my favorite stone that i've been working with besides like the geodes uh, I'm a really big fan of Maury Mountain Moss Agate from Oregon. Uh, it's about three hours away from here. And it's rad as heck, and I still have yet to make it to Maury Mountain, but I definitely buy a lot of Moss Agate. I have like a milk crate full of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Oh, super cool. Uh, yeah, I love it. It's, uh, it's a great stone. It's really earthy. Uh, it doesn't give me much shit. It's super solid. And it's always, like, impressive to kind of see, like, what is going on with it. 
That's really cool. Um, yeah. I, so I've had people come into our studio and they have allergic reactions to certain veins in rocks. Is that something that's super common in your experience or do you know anything about that? What kind of veins are you talking about? Like in, um, no, I'm forgetting the name of it. Let me think if I can remember. Amethyst. What color is it? Amethyst? Amethyst. Okay. Yeah. Like it's purple. <laughs> what, like the cacoxonite? It might be. I'm not exactly sure what cacoxonite is. Cacoxonite is that like brown stuff that you'll see in amethyst. Yeah. But amethyst shouldn't really give you any sort of issue because it's just quartz. Like that's it's what like I was purple. Thinking. It's purple quartz. Like that's all it is. Okay. I was um, I had like a customer come in and they're like, I can only do stones without veins in them. And I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So the other thing is too, like on a vein, when a stone has a vein it could potentially be like a healed crack mm. or some sort of like geological event happened to where there's just like two pieces of the stone like yeah they're together but you'll see like a f it'll be like almost like a hairline fracture yeah but like you can try to like pull it apart and it's not going to come apart but that fracture just like doesn't go away like no okay. matter how far you grind and it, it doesn't make sense to me um because okay. rocks are weird but because I'm not a geologist by any means, and I only, <laughs> I only know some geological stuff because of like the folks in my in the lapidary community here in Portland and Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. Um, but maybe they have like a sensitivity to like those little fractures, like those like fine hairs or like micro pitting, because um, some people have like really sensitive skin. But I've never heard of anyone really having an issue with amethyst. Um, you can have issues with material that's heavily copper bearing oh, potentially okay. uh, but then there's also some materials that are just like not safe to wear um like malachite like genuine malachite is toxic um bumblebee jasper it makes me so mad when i see so much of it being used in the rock industry and like i see some folks like use it in jewelry and stuff and i'm just like yeah it's like really pretty and you're not gonna get these colors but I'm just like, why are you even doing that? <laughs> yeah. What? Um, some people will coat it in resin or whatever, so it doesn't leach, but it's like, it has asbestos in it. Oh, wow. Like naturally occur. I think it's asbestos or it's arsenic. It's one of the, one of those two. One of uh, the bad yeah. A's. <laughs> yeah, one of the bad A's. Um, and it's just like, yeah, I don't know. They're not like safe. And it's like super unfortunate that like countries will carve them with like minimal like health uh, standards and stuff. And yeah, it just, they'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's really bad. A lot of people are starting to become aware of like metal qualities, but I think it's at least with the customers that I've interacted with the idea that stones or things that they put in their, their stretched lobes could be toxic mm -hmm. is a very yeah, yeah. new concept to a lot of people. Exactly. Um, and when it comes down to that too, like toxic, toxicity materials, like stone, there are definitely some that will like give you a run for your money, like bumblebee jasper and malachite. But then like for wood, that's even more hardcore. Um, cause I only can wear wood because mm. of like the weight thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there's my roommate is an ex wood turner and it's a really good example. Um, he's a stone carver now and he does some wood projects and stuff. Like he'll make me plugs and stuff, but he can't really carve wood as much or even wear wood because he's had a botanical allergy to it. And once you have one really bad botanical allergy, you cannot wear wood anymore. Like your ears don't handle it. So like, uh, for an example, like there's a wood called Grenadillo that some people don't have an issue with. And I've never really heard of many people having an issue with it, but my ears like kind of get like peppery, like they okay. just hurt a little bit. Um, and then, when I'm wearing those, it's kind of uncomfortable. And then if I were to keep trying to wear those, I might develop an allergy to wood in its entirety. So for like the, yeah, to like a botanical allergy. So it's like, cool, I can't wear any wood. Like I can't wear like the chemical makeup that makes wood. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. That's yeah, it would be really bad. So uh, <laughs> stuff like, so like wood is kind of like, it's I love it. I love the material and I've always been a really big fan of like wood plugs. Um, but it's not the 
most benign option. Uh, glass is your safest option. It is chemically inert. Like no one's allergic to it. Yeah. Uh, so that's great. Titanium. Um, I've never really heard of people being allergic to it, but there's definitely people that probably can be. I've met one person who's allergic to titanium. Yeah. And I mean, it's yeah. so few and far between. Uh, <laughs> Like yeah. way less people are allergic to titanium than they are like steel. Yeah. So, but Which like stainless is, steel uh, still isn't like bad. It's just yeah. titanium is just safer. Yeah, I think I think it gets a bad rep, but it, it really isn't like I, like I can wear steel and it's fine. You know, it's just the quality yeah. of the polish and the quality of what's put in there. Yeah, and it depends on the grade of steel and all that jazz. Yeah, you're like, are so. you getting high grade hot dogs or are you getting like low grade hot dogs when it comes to Steve. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure hot dogs are all just bad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's but, funny. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Um. So let's see what. Looking back at my questions, I got off track. Uh. So you have Redfern Adornments, and then you mentioned another company. Yeah. So um, people that know me or Red Fern, they've seen my other company known as Secret Handshake Company, which is, uh, it's an adult novelty store that I run. Uh, and I make uh, stone inlaid butt plugs and we do collars and uh, stone ball gags. Wow. And uh, we, we do them in collaboration with uh, May over at Rhea Design. She's down in uh, LA. And okay. she's a really great friend of mine, and she helps us put out awesome, awesome pieces. And May, if you're watching, thank you, and <laughs> keep doing what you're doing because it's awesome. And I'm really happy that I get to do this with you. Um, and yeah, it's just another facet of the business. And it all used to be under Red Fern, but then my mom started liking pictures of that stuff on Red Fern, <laughs> so I was like, well, I need to branch off a little bit and um, just offer this on another platform. And I figured Secret Handshake was like silly, but also discreet and kind of like suggestive. And I don't know, it just fits the bill. And it's just like a silly little, it was a silly side project, but now it's like actually like getting legs and starting to walk. And it's it's pretty wild to like just see it happen cool. like this. Yeah, someone yeah. asked me for an Amethyst butt plug and I was like, well, I can do this. and. Then their friends asked me and then more people started asking me and then I started selling to sex shops and like all over the country and it's just really cool. Well, it makes sense because, you know, with body jewelry, it started off as very like, make, you know, like surgical, like it was just like no color, you know, or if it was color, it was like plated and then it became like this very like elegant process and it would make sense mm -hmm. that with, um, you know adult entertainment that it would it's also very like you know it's like leather and steel or you know and now to incorporate like beautiful stones and things like that into the process it makes sense that that would start to you know get its own audience and its own role you know ball rolling yeah for sure so but yeah it's been it's been fun and i've definitely met some wild people <laughs> but uh it's all in good fun and um i i really like just i don't know providing products if it's jewelry or the other thing uh, <laughs> to folks that just like really appreciate it and i get to use like my skill set in another light um because like yeah making jewelry is fun and stuff but sometimes it gets a little boring but making like the world's first amber ball gag is pretty cool like yeah that's like, like you can that. say that you know <laughs> Yeah, I can. <laughs> you can. Well, and, I mean, you're only rad. 26, so to imagine that you could, like, you know, I'm only 24, and I've done so many things in my life, and now you're doing so many things in your life, you know. We're young. I'm trying. There's so yeah. many facets and chapters ahead. Yeah, I'm into that. COVID <laughs> pending. <laughs> yeah, COVID pending for sure. But we'll, we'll get through that too for, but we got this. Yeah, we're young. It's fine. But yeah. Awesome. Well, I guess before I let you go for the rest of your day, um, do you ha what advice would you have for anyone who is, uh, you know, curious in stone carving? I guess. Um, when it comes down to stone carving or any sort of like jewelry making, um, just check your local community. Um, here in Portland, we have the Mount Hood Lapidary Society or something. I'm not a member of it, but 
um, yeah, they have like, I think it's like five bucks or whatever, just to like go in and like use their machines. Um, and they like hold little classes and there's a bunch of people that are 30 times the age of us that have been doing this stuff since the dawn of time. And they <laughs> definitely know a thing or two about a thing or two. Uh, so that's really cool. And uh, like I was mentioning earlier, Facebook is a really good resource as well because there's a lot of um, just nice folks to talk to. Um, like I just talked to someone like two weeks ago about something I never thought I would ever do. And he like, hey, you should try this. It really, it works really well for me. And I was like, okay. And I tried it out and I fell in love with it. And it's just because being uh, mainly self-taught like it's just been trial and error for me yeah and i'm always just trying to find the next thing to put out a better product or try to do it in a more timely fashion because your wrists and hands wear out eventually and if i can try to keep them going <laughs> yeah well and stone carving is a huge um physical labor At least yeah i mean it's it's not as bad because i mean i have a lot of machines oh yeah so and i use modern techniques i don't use like a chisel and hammer <laughs> i've done the chisel and hammer that is hard <laughs> yeah no you wouldn't get like the polish i get on agate and stuff with the chisel and hammer no um, <laughs> yeah, i use like diamond grinding wheels and i start at like coarse grits uh like 60 grit and i finish all the way at fifty thousand grit okay so i try to get that glassy glassy finish and i go farther than some people do and it's fun but yeah uh check like your local communities um depends where you are some people might have something in your town or they might be in the next town over or somewhere in your county or at least somewhere in your state if you live on the east coast um and it's definitely a trade that is it's not that it's dying it's just not a lot of young people are getting into it and i think it's really fun and i think that more people should get involved in stone carving even if they're not making jewelry just to like get into it because it's like pretty therapeutic it is a little expensive to start but there's enough resources and folks selling used equipment that it shouldn't be that costly yeah but i mean it's and if, you, if you do the chisel approach just on just regular stone carving just for sculpture's sake it's it's not that cost effective you know or not you know that expensive you can just yeah yeah for sure on. yeah it just all depends on like exactly what stone you're trying to work and what you're trying to achieve at the end of it so yeah there's like a lot of resources online um and i think there's even some like youtube stuff but yeah when it comes to like making body jewelry there's not many resources at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you got to get a little inventive and just think outside the box and me having a lot of stretch piercings i'm like oh cool well this would work here because of like how your anatomy sits here like with t-back librettes like who would have thought yeah like I have a silver one right here, like, when, like, who would have thought that this would have been it? Yeah. Like, would have been how, like, how you wear a piece of jewelry in your mouth. Like, yeah. Uh, trial and error. So, that's what it comes down to. Well, very cool. Well, thank you yeah. so much, Jagger, for your time. Thank and you uh, for letting me do this. Yeah, well, it was great to meet you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And, uh, you know, you I'm well. excited to check out your red friend adornments. Yeah, uh, you can always check out or after COVID's over, maybe come by the shop and check it out too. That would be super cool. Yeah, I'm up in St. John's, so it's not too far oh, okay. from, yeah, it's not that bad. I'm not in like Corvallis or yeah. like somewhere far, so it's not bad. St. John's is not far at all. <laughs> I think it's like 15, well, depends on traffic. It can either be 15 minutes or like three days. <laughs> it depends on probably traffic. So, but right on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, yeah, this has been an awesome experience. Awesome. Bye. All right, see ya. See ya.